Hey, it's Sheila Social Studies. Hey guys, hey guys, welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. The last time I left you off, we were talking about the Compromise of 1850 and California coming in as a free state and the Southerners getting the Fugitive Slave Law and ending the slave trade in Washington, D.C. and everything like that. Now we're going to talk about probably the largest, most influential thing that really we can say leads up to or led up to the Civil War. And this is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So let's get into it right here. When we're talking about the beginning of our history of our nation, we're talking about compromises, negotiations, compromises, arguments going back and forth between non-slaveholding states and slaveholding states. So we're going to talk about, look at this, the debate over the expansion of slavery influenced many things. The governmental compromises, like I said, the three-fifths compromise for every five slaves, only three count for representation in the South. The great compromise again representation and you can add that three-fifths compromise into the great compromise because it's talking about how you represent slaves territories becoming states the northwest ordinance of 1787 banned slavery in its first westward expansion the annexing of territories andrew jackson wouldn't annex texas immediately why because it was a slave state it would cause an imbalance presidential elections is the one of the last things we're talking about here what slavery has a big effect on in 1852, the presidential election is between Democrat, right there on top, Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce honors the Compromise of 1850, that one we just covered, and the Fugitive Slave Act. He's saying that those two things are A-OK -okay in his eyes. Southerners then would trust Franklin Pierce because he is all about the Fugitive Slave Act. The Whigs, who is the opposing party at this time, uh, they select Winfield Scott, that war hero from the Mexican-American War, the beginning uh, general of the Union Army during the Civil War. So Winfield Scott did not fully support the Compromise of 1850. He definitely did not support the Fugitive Slave Act. So the South really did not like Winfield Scott. They distrusted him. They didn't like him. And in this election in 1852, because of the support of the South, Franklin Pierce wins handedly. He carried 27 states compared to Scott's four. So it was a blowout in this election. So 1854, what we have going on here is this guy on the top right there, Stephen Douglas. He introduces the Kansas-Nebraska Act to Congress. Here's what he wants. He's a senator for Illinois, and he wants to build the Transcontinental Railroad through the Midwestern part of our country with a transportation hub being located in Chicago, his city and his state. So in order to do this, he knows he's gonna have to get support of the North and support of the South, and he's gonna have to have some slave states in there, slaves, Irish immigrants are gonna be working on the railroad, stuff like that. So what he says is he's gonna divide the remainder of the Louisiana Purchase, that center part of our nation, into two territories, Nebraska on the bottom, I mean, I'm sorry, Kansas on the bottom, and Nebraska on top. And what his idea was, was popular sovereignty. This is why this was a vocabulary word in your chapter. For He says he will allow the people in each one of those territories to vote whether they wanted to be a slave state or not. And this is what, we, again, we call popular sovereignty. This is him trying to solve the slavery, the slavery problem. He's saying that the government shouldn't get involved. The people should be allowed to vote if they want slaves or not. So what does that do to the Missouri Compromise of 1820? It basically eliminates the restriction of slavery in the North because both of these territories lie above that 3630 line. So once they were to issue popular sovereignty in here, the Missouri Compromise of 1820 would just be null and void. Southern states were upset because 
both of these territories were above the 3630 line, which would mean they would become free territories of free states. Abolitionists, on the other hand, are furious about the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 because both of those territories, which are above the 3630 line, could potentially become slave territories. So we have the government, you have abolitionists, you have southern slave owners, pro slavery people in the South. They are going nuts over this Kansas Nebraska Act in 1854. It can change a lot of things coming up. So Stephen Douglas pushes this Kansas Nebraska Act and he gains the support from the South because he says, hey, guess what, guys? If you help me pass this act, I'll just give you Kansas as a slave state, right? Or a slave territory. You'll be able to have that territory with no problem. We can make it for you. So in 1854, the Kansas Nebraska Act is passed. Douglas compromised with the South by saying, hey, Nebraska uh, can become a territory using popular sovereignty. Kansas can be a slave territory. And all the other territories would be able to use popular sovereignty to decide the future slavery debate in all those new territories and all those new federal lands. So here you have a picture of here from compromise to conflict. You have that first compromise, the Missouri Compromise, then you have the Compromise of 1850, and now you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Like I said, probably one of the biggest things that leads up to the Civil War. So what happens after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and really what are we talking about here? You have pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces that are just clashing violently. There's many skirmishes, there's battles. These are called bleeding Kansas. You have a couple hundred people who are dying. We call these really the first shots of the Civil War. Not the actual Civil War where you have Union versus the Confederate States of America, but this is really the first time pro-slavery and anti-slavery slavery forces are battling each other now over there in Kansas. This is why it's called Bleeding Kansas. People are dying. Abolitionists from surrounding states, northern states, are trying to rush down to Kansas to be able to vote for them to be a free state. Pro-slavery, border ruffians, people from Missouri, people from the south are rushing into Kansas to be able to make them a slave state. So you have abolitionists, anti-slavery, pro-slavery people from Missouri and such going into Kansas to, to vote to see if they're going to be a slave state or not. The beginning part, the very first part, slavery, I mean, Kansas is called, you know, they call themselves the free state, but that's not the way it began. They actually began as a slave state, and this government creates strict laws that, like, if you helped a fugitive or if you helped a slave, you could be put to death abolitionist groups to fight this they create a new government called the free soil party to protest against this pierce only recognizes pro-slavery um legislature and the argument over slavery affects everybody in kansas so it's slavery kansas bleeding kansas pro-slavery, anti-slavery forces, and they are fighting each other in the state. Because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the territories of uh, Kansas and Nebraska can use popular sovereignty to decide if they want to vote. I'm going over this again. You'll see it again, I promise you. It allows the people in the territories to vote if they want slaves or not. Basically, this goes against the Missouri Compromise. It made it unconstitutional. It says Congress can't decide to if territories can be slave or free anymore. Because of the Kansas and Nebraska Act, they're saying it's okay, it's legal. This is the way we're going to decide slavery from now on. We're going to use popular sovereignty, allow the people to vote. So northern and southern Whigs now, they're dividing uh, on this Kansas-Nebraska Act. Southern Whigs uh, move south. They become part of the Democratic political party, while northern Whigs, they break off and they actually wind up being the basis or creating the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, who would leave them to presidency. So this is what we're talking about in the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. What's happening in a nutshell, quick review, Stephen Douglas of Illinois wants to move the Transcontinental Railroad using Chicago as a main hub going out west. In order to do that, he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the, these new territories, Kansas and Nebraska, they're both above the 3630 line. We're going to allow them to use popular sovereignty, vote for slavery. Southerners are mad. Northerners are mad. They all flood to Kansas. 
Kansas is originally voted a slavery state. They create a harsh government in which the President of the United States, Franklin Pierce, listens to. And this is where we have bleeding Kansas. This is where you have the first shots of the quote unquote Civil War. You have pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces now fighting each other in, in Kansas over the issue of slavery.